how do you measure love? Can you quantify it? And I believe you can, and I set out to find a model for it. Now, I could spend five minutes talking about how I derived this model. But for the sake of time, I'm just going to show you the results of that research. I broke the, the complex process of love down into a set of variables, each of which is easier to measure. The sum of the variables tell you whether you're in love or not. So you can score low on one or two of them and still raise reach high enough to be considered in love. Now the first variable or axis is sex appeal. Very obviously, if you have enough of a sex attraction for the person, you get that infatuation with them, it's very easy to feel like you're in love. So there is a point at which, from zero to that point of sex appeal, that you feel like you're in love. The second variable or axis is what I call fun or friendship. Do you, in fact, have a history of enjoying yourself when you're with this person? So this axis is called fun. Some friendships are so long lasting and so solid that they are almost a love unto themselves all alone. But it takes a very large amount of that feeling before you actually cross over from deep, deep friendship into love. But when you put the two of them together, they work together, and you can actually reach a point at which you're not in love because of friendship, and you're not in love with sex appeal, but you're definitely above the point at which you're in love. The third axis is what I call nesting. And nesting has to do with, if I tie my life to this person's life, am I going to get the kind of lifestyle that I want? Do you want a white picket fence in the suburbs? Do you want a glamorous, jet-setting life of, of celebrity parties, etc.? If you can find a person that can help you achieve that kind of lifestyle, that can become a very attractive a prospect. And together, they make a zone. Above that zone, you're in love. Below that zone, you're not in love. Princess Di and Prince Charles looked like they were in love. When they got together, when they were at that wedding, I mean, we all called that a fantasy romance. And yet, when, a few years later, they were getting a divorce. Why? What happened? Well, if we can look at our model. It turns out there wasn't really that much sexual attraction there. He was already having an affair with Camilla Bowles. She, you know, look at those ears on him. <laughs> <laughs> the fun aspect, too. They, during the dating period, they were trying really hard. But they really liked different worlds. He wanted cloudy Scotland shooting. She wanted sunny San Tropez beaches. But if she married him, she would become the Queen of England. Even as a teenager, she would tell people that she was babysitting. I am going to marry the Prince of Wales someday. And so she scored high enough on this one point to generate a genuine feeling of love. Unfortunately, life in the palace turned out to be much more constricting than she thought. And as that nesting feeling diminished, there weren't strong enough points on the other axis to take up the loss, and she fell down into the outer world zone. Prince Charles suffered a similar when, uh, loss of nesting when he discovered that he was going to have to live in her shadow for glamour for the rest of his life. And they had nothing else to go for. It. I know a couple here in Silicon Valley who had a very good marriage, and yet they seemed to be growing apart. Then the dot-com bust happened, 
and their marriage got better. This seems very counterintuitive. Are, isn't financial hardship supposed to make, uh, uh, put more of a strain on a marriage? What was happening was, although they, they were the, had the, you know, relatively the same amount of sex attraction and the same amount of fun, the increased dot boom that gave them so much more spending power and so many more options caused their goals in life to change. And they were out of sync with each other. And when they had that financial reversal, it brought their goals back into a line and their, net, uh, their nesting instinct index went back up and they came back in a line and they rose out of it. So if you want to increase your feelings of love for the person you love. Look at these three axes. Can you increase the amount of fun you're having with the person, the amount of time you enjoy with them? If you're not liking the same things, can you find things that you both like? Secondly, sex attraction. You know, are you just a little tired? Are you just getting a little complacent? Should you be working at spicing it up somehow, maybe renew the interest? And very importantly, to look at where you want to go in life. And are you both still heading in that? And set goals that you can both work towards as a team. Now, I was concerned when I'd made this model. Was this a arbitrary decisions that I'd made? Or was there, was this really a pattern? And I really actually found a underlying pattern to this. The fun has to do with the history you have with this person. So it's the past. Sex attraction is that instantaneous feeling you have when you see the person. So it's the present. And nesting has to do with projecting your feelings into the future. So it's the future. And I think this may be where we get this feeling that love is timeless. Because when we feel it, we're feeling it in all directions of time. I'm always tinkering and trying to fine tune this model. So if you have any comments or insights into it, I would definitely welcome them. In fact, I have come up with one major revision to this model since I first created it. And that is a fourth variable or a fourth dimension. Now, I couldn't draw it, obviously, but those who are familiar with mathematical models can understand the fourth dimension. And this is the dark side of love. I call it the habit of concern. And I'm going to leave it for a future talk. Thank you.